you. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, when I got up here, thank you, Pastor John. When I got up here earlier today, and I took a look at this church and this perspective from up on the stage, I got to tell you, it's completely different from what I'm used to. Because if you don't know me, I, I'm right around the corner. Uh, I run the, the Generation Kids, and I'm in these little chairs all the time, right? And my knees are up here by my ears, and I'm trying to, trying to preach and teach and make sure the kids get the message. So this is great. I finally get to talk to the adults of this beautiful church. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I, listen, I hope everyone had a blessed, very blessed, uh, enjoyable Christmas. God is good. God is good. I know that, uh, you know, if you don't know, I run a tutoring agency. I am constantly busy, and even I had a time to oh, finally just relax and, you know, spend some time in, in uh, just worshiping God, and uh, I didn't get to go up to Ohio where I grew up, so I got a chance to reminisce with some cousins um, over the phone, and it was, it was, wow, what a great time. I hope everyone else had a great time as well. So I'm reminiscing with my cousins, like I said, didn't get it to get up there this year, and uh, we're thinking of times when we are younger and all of this great times that we had, right? I'm from a very Italian family, yes, my last name's Mancini, very Italian family, and in my family, there, is, there was an expectation that just you could not miss, and that was Sunday dinners, you were expected to be at the grandparents' house for Sunday dinner. No questions asked. That's the way it was. So there was this one Sunday, my cousin Brian is telling me on the phone, he's like, hey, you remember that time we're over at Grandma's and blah, 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 and we're getting ready for brunch, and it's the, all the cousins are there, and there were more boys and girls, uh, girl cousins, and it, it was just, we were getting rowdy. We were getting rowdy, and I could tell the parents, the grandparents, getting frustrated, and it finally just cracked. They were like, you boys, out of here. Get out. You're done. We are tired of putting up with you. You're too rowdy. We're too, too, too tired of yelling at you. Just get out. Get out. Well, okay, all of us boys, we know what to do, right? We're, we're going out in the backyard, and we get out there, and we're like, wait, 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 wait. Let's go down to the lake. Myers Lake. It was this little park near their house, right? The lake was kind of big, but we, we knew what to do, right? We had it all figured out. So we stop in Grandpa's shed. We get the rods. We get our tackle box. We head off. All these little boys just doing their thing. Here we go. We're going down to Myers Lake. The rules were simple. The rules were simple. We'd been there many times. You go, when you get down there, you go to the new section, the new section where they had the new piers, the new boardwalks, the benches, the picnic tables, everything was, it was all laid out. It was right there for you. And there was this old section on the other side of the lake, eh, rotted, overgrown, it just rotted wood. It was just not interesting anymore. Stay away from that. Go to the new section. It was simple. We had it. We knew what to do. So us, we get over there and everything's going great. When we get to that new section, people everywhere. Everyone had had the same idea that day. And us boys are thinking, this isn't going to work. There's no place to fish. There's no place to go and do our thing. Come on, this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't what we want. We had the idea. We'll go to the old section. That section where we know we're not supposed to be. But that's where we're going to go, right? Who's going to know? Who's going to know? No big deal. So trek on over to the old side, break out our tackle, get the fishing rods ready, and we start fishing. Bunch of boys. We're catching small fish, the little sunfish, the little blue fish. Okay, bunch of boys, small fish, nah. This isn't going to keep our attention. Well, my cousin Brian's telling me on the phone as we go, you know, talking and talking. He goes, remember I started telling you, the deeper the water, there you have it. How did you know? Right there. And I'm the oldest cousin. I'm like, okay, I was probably nine, yeah, fourth, fifth grade. I'm like, okay, yeah. So what do we do? Climb up onto the old rotted pier. 
yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll get up there. So I'm climbing up, bringing my tackle, got my rod, and I'm out a little bit, you know, as far as I felt comfortable. Start casting. Still the small fish. Still the small fish. And I can hear my cousin Brian over here going, no, 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 I meant the deeper water. The deeper water, right? So I start inching out a little bit further. All right, yeah, shaking your head. You know this, right? So I'm, shit, I'm coming out, right? I got this all figured out. And right about this time, I kind of notice they're not following me. They're not coming with me. I'm taking the advice to get to the deeper water, but they're not coming. That should have been a clue. That should have been a clue right there, right? But I, you know, hear me, I, I don't understand. I, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I can do this. And so I'm out there, and I'm kind of looking at where to step and everything, and I, I think to myself, well, let's, these bigger boards right here, not the ones that go horizontal, the bigger boards, they're like the frame boards. They're connected right to the piling. I'll step on those. I know what I'm doing. I got this, right? No problem. So I start stepping on him, and I'm getting out there and out there, and he's still screaming, no, the deeper water. All right, so I've made it now all the way to the end of the pier. All the way to the end of the pier. And I'm thinking, all right, I can see nothing but water there. Deeper water. Here I go. Right now. This is where we're going to load up my hook. Got the bobber ready. All right, start to balance myself, and I get that rod ready. And I'm whipping it out there with that wrist, just like I was taught. And I send that bobber and that hook way out to the deep water. I'm going to get out there. I want that big fish. Right? And as I whipped it, I started hearing a cracking sound. I start hearing the cracking sound. And I see the bobber going, and I don't want to take my eye off it. I'm getting out there. This is great. I'm going to get way out there, way out there. And I'm watching that bobber and that hook. And I, I can remember it clear as day. I'm feeling that wood beneath my feet start to give way. It is starting to give way. And I promise you, as I'm watching that hook go out to that water, right before it gets to the surface, right before it's about to touch down, I hit the surface of the water right beneath that pier. Uh, it happened so suddenly. I can clearly remember I, I was standing like this in water. It was up to about here, right? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, my face is wet. I'm, I'm cold all of a sudden. Wait, wait, what's going on? My shoes are squishy. I'm trying to lift my shoes up, and they feel like they weigh 100 pounds. And over onto my right side, I could clearly run. My cousins are yelling. They're screaming. They're going crazy. And I can hear that they're screaming, Dad, Dad, Dad. They're going to get my uncle. They're going to get my uncle. And I know this is, just, this is not what I'm going to need. This is not what I'm going to need because sooner or later I'm going to look up and I'm going to see my uncle looking down at me. Well, in the words I won't repeat here in church. I know it's coming. I know it's coming, right? Well, in my infinite eight-year-old wisdom, nine-year-old, whatever it was at that time, I knew. I knew I had what I needed to make that decision that I wanted to make to get out to that deeper water. But when I hit the water, and I'm cold and muddy, and, and, and I know I'm about to get in trouble... That's when I start to realize, wait, 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 wait. You know, impulsively listening to the suggestions of my cousin, yeah, that didn't get me where I wanted to be. That wasn't it, right? Relying upon my own understanding, you know, step on the big boards, the frame boards, right? right? No, mm -mm, nope, that didn't get me to where I wanted to be. That didn't get me to where I wanted to be. No, that wasn't it. What I needed that day was something else. And I only figured it out once I hit that icy cold water. I needed the right advice. I needed the advice that was going to get me to where I wanted to be. And it was at that moment I realized, yeah, that's not what I got. That is not what I got. We all know that the right advice is helpful. 
We all know this. We instinctively know it. And as I was going through, like, what are some of the ways that I can make this relate to the congregation? Well, you know, one of the ways that I came up with is when we're all getting ready to make that big purchase. That big purchase, you know. Maybe it's that TV that you need, that appliance that you need, the new cell phone, the new computer. Heck, maybe it's something as big as a, a car that you need to buy, right? And you're going through the, the motions. You know that you've got this huge decision that you've got to make. You've got all the information. It's at your fingertips. You have the internet, right? You've got consumer reports. You can do all of these things where you go and read all these reviews, right? It's all at your fingertips. You got your neighbor, right? Bob's helping you out. He's trying to help you make this great decision. But it's at these times where we start to realize, we become keenly aware that we are going to be stuck with whatever decision we make for a long time. We're a long time. We are going, to, we get into this, this mode where we get tempted to maybe move a little bit quicker than we wanted, to act a little bit quicker than what we, what we know we should do. Right? It's human nature. We all get into this and we're, we're in a hurry. And we don't want to feel the regret. We don't want to go on to, to regret this decision later on and have to live with it. But we, th that temptation is there. It's absolutely there. And we get to the point where we're ready to pull the trigger. We're, we're ready to take the plunge. Right? Maybe I shouldn't use the word plunge with my lake story there, but... We're ready to take the plunge and just move on with our life. Move on with our life. And that's the way it goes. And, I, you know, I got to thinking about this. We do this a lot with God in our life. We do this a lot with God. You know, we all begin that process where we're seeking the advice. We want that advice for the problems that we're facing, for that, that dilemma that we have, for that difficulty we want a solution that's truly going to make us happy. That's the, the solution that's truly going to bring us that satisfaction that we're seeking after, right? We only think of this regret once we're feeling the sting, once we're feeling the pain of that decision. That's when we're finally realizing it, right? Right? And I was thinking, I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm a, I'm a math guy. I'm a math guy. I run a, a tutoring agency, uh, and I teach math and science. I, I teach all the STEM, the STEM uh, subjects. So I'm real into formulas. And I was kind of thinking to myself as a parent, this message, and, you know, how to make it to relate to all of us. And, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had this machine, right? This machine, this this little mechanism right there where we could take all the factors of our, our process, our decision, and we just simply plug it into the machine. The machine does its thing, it's working, and out the other end, it spits out an answer. You pull out the little paper, boom, there it is. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do right there. It'd be great to have that. Well, the Bible is full of stories like this because the great news is God does have this formula, this machine. It's already there for you. It's there. There's, there's a particular man in the Bible, and I teach this man's story um, to the kids a lot, that we can learn this formula from, this formula, right? It's the formula for success in our life. It truly, truly is. And there's a lot we can learn from this particular guy who, you know, the only thing I could say is that he just needs so much more than what he understands in his world around him. He needs way more than what he has. Way more. And the time of this man is... I mean, it's 850 years before the birth of our Lord and Savior. So it's his message is timeless. The main character of this story is a highly regarded man by the name of Naaman. 
Naaman, well-respected, popular commander of the Syrian army. The most powerful army on the face of the earth at that time. Right? This is a man and his army who is land after land, empire after empire, conquering and conquering and conquering. There is no one who wants to feel Naaman's wrath. There is no one who wants to go up against the Syrian army. And Naaman was their head, was their commander, right? And inside Syria, Naaman was this, he was looked upon as having the favor of God. People, they just loved him. He was highly regarded, highly respected, right? He was used to the parades and the accolades and the respect that people gave him. He was looked upon very favorably by the Syrian king, his master. His master loved him. It was, that was the king's right-hand man. Naaman was the man. He was the man, right? And no matter how many times this man had been honored, no matter how many times he had been given compliments and respect and the parades and everything, he needed more. He did more. His story is brought to us in um, 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5. And I'll, I'll go ahead and, and read verse 1. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor but he was a leper. And the Syrians had got out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. See, folks, when I said that he needed much more, much more anything out of his understanding, Naaman had a problem, huge problem. The man had leprosy. Now, leprosy, if you don't know, it's a very visible skin disease. Shows up as brown spots all over your body, but particularly right on the tips of your fingers, nose, ears. It's visible. It can be seen. You can't hide it. Right? Now, you've got to imagine that Naaman, being the man in Syria, being the king's right-hand man, had access to everything. Had access to everything. He had access to the latest skin lotions. He had access to the latest anti-aging serums, right? Everything being advertised. He had access to all of the latest medical advances. He, all of this was at his disposal. He even had access to the king's physicians. He was at the spas. He was at the salon getting all of this stuff. Nothing was working. Nothing was working for Naaman. This was completely out of the realm of understanding for him. And quite frankly, anyone else. That's what leprosy was back then. Right? So, as we move on, nothing's working for this guy. What could we do? Well, let me continue with the story. Let us continue to, to learn from, from Naaman. Okay, now this captive girl that they, they brought back, she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, the king, the king of Syria, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Church, here we see a man of Naaman's stature, right? Think of the most, one of the most powerful men anyway. And he is so desperate at this point, so desperate in fact, that he steps out of his own understanding to that of a mere servant girl. A little girl. This is a man who has tried everything. The king's physicians, he's had it all at his disposal. 
He's so desperate, he listens to one of his servants who is just a child. Just a child. Why not? Why not? Right? Nothing else was working. He had become so desperate that he was willing to step out of his own understanding. Turn his face to God. And church, that is my first point. It's right there in your notes if you'd like to fill it in. If, if you want God to be part of your situation, then you, then God, excuse me, then God must be part of the decision. Point one. Point one. You know, I was thinking of, of uh, people giving gifts over Christmas and everything, right? And how God kind of puts that desire in all of our hearts, right? We want to get that perfect gift. We want to make it right. We want to, that's the, 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 giving the perfect gift feels so good. And I was especially thinking of this as I was um, enjoying my college-age son. He's off in Gainesville. He finally comes down to visit every once in a while. As I'm watching him open his gifts, you know, and for the last couple of years, it's been great. I've been getting him the gifts that he wants, right? Well, I can remember a time, and some of you are parents, and you certainly know this, where no matter what I did, no matter what I bought, no matter what I tried, I could never seem to get this kid the exact gift he wanted. And I can remember the Christmas where I, it, it just finally hit me. He was in middle school, and as most of you know, in middle school, they're real into their clothes. They're real into what they're wearing and everything. And I am keenly aware of this, and so I'm watching him as he's looking at certain commercials, as he's looking at his cell phone, as he's on the computer, whatever it is that he's saying when we're out at a store, whatever he's really, really looking at, I am paying close attention because I am going to get it right. I was determined. I am going to get this right. I'm going to get this kid the perfect gift. All right? And so it came down. He was looking at a pair of jeans and everything, and I, 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 I remember feeling so confident I knew exactly which pair he wanted. I knew it was there. I was, I was so confident. I finally, I just bought him. It's like, this, I know I got it this time. I'm absolutely certain, right? I'm absolutely certain. If you have kids, you know what I'm saying. You're like, absolutely, I got it. I know, I know this is the right pair of jeans for him, right? I go home. I wrap it. Christmas morning comes. He finally gets up out of bed. All right, yeah, there we go. There's kids for you. He finally gets up out of bed, and he's going over to the tree, and I'm telling him, yeah, that package right there, yeah, that's the one you want right there. Go ahead, yeah. And he grabs that gift, starts unwrapping it, right, opens up that box, looks in, and that fake smile, that fake smile where you're going, ugh. Ah, oh, and he manages with that smile to squeeze out those words, you know, you know, when they're faking it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I remember throwing my hands up, just like, what is it that I got to do? I, I mean, it was, I'm sitting there thinking about it, and it just hit me. It finally just hit me. This was the Christmas that I had finally surrendered all, and I just said, that's it. You are, I'm going to just ask you, you're going to be part of the decision for every gift that I get you from here till the day you die. This is it. I am done. I am done. I can't handle this anymore. I was so tired of being let down. Right? And I, I can remember, it was just, I, it was that, that moment of surrender, the revelation. I, if anybody was taking a picture of me that morning, there was a huge light bulb above my head. It was there. It was there. And I did, that was it. That was the moment I surrendered. Let us take a look at the Bible. Let us take a look at the Bible, what it teaches us. Let's examine a verse that comes to us where Jesus is trying to teach us, just ask. Just do it. 
right? And this verse comes to us in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. See, Naaman, this verse, let me, let me back up here. This verse really right here is telling us that we need to acknowledge God in all of his ways, right? We're not merely supposed to just lean on our own understanding. We do, though. We do. I know I have done it, and I certainly was doing it with the gifts that I was buying. Um, who better to ask? Truly, who better to ask than the designer of our world for advice? Who is it that you could possibly add? Just like the revelation I gave. Who is it better to ask for the gift that they want? Who is truly a better person to ask? For the designer of this world, it's God. It's God. Just ask. Right? See, after leaning upon his own understanding for the longest time, Naaman had finally come to this realization. Right? His big revelation, that big light bulb moment for him, was to turn and acknowledge the God of Israel just as this little girl was telling him to do. Nothing he was doing was working. That must be the answer. Turn to God. Right? You see this in lots of decisions all the time. All the time. People coming to this revelation moment. That revelation moment where you just kind of say, it's sort of that last ditch effort, right? That last ditch effort to, to, to get it right. God, just tell me what I should do. Just tell me. Just tell me. Well, let us continue uh, learning about Naaman as he is on this great quest, right? This quest that was suggested to him by a servant girl who had spurred this great man into actions that he had never, ever considered. Who spurred this man to run immediately to the most powerful man in the world and say, look, 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 look what this little girl has done. Look what she's suggesting to me. And then for the king, the king, he hears this, right? Then the king of Syria said, go now, right? Naaman is standing in front of the most powerful man on earth. Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised. One king talking to another king. Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened. When the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes. Back in that time, that was a sign of great distress. Am I a god to kill and make alive? That this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? <laughs> Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. The king of Israel looked at this as if it was an act of war. An act of war. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent it to the king saying... Why have you torn your clothes? See, Elisha's all calm at this point. Right? Elisha's calm. Why have you torn your clothes? Please, let him come to me. 
and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and his chariots, and he stood. He stood at the door of Elisha's house. Right? And Elisha doesn't even come to the door. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious. Naaman's furious at this. And he went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God. And he'll wave his hand over this place and he will heal me of the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, the rivers back in his homeland, aren't they better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned, and he went away in rage. And his servants came near, and they spoke to him, and they said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then, right? When he says to you, wash and be clean. Church, can, can you believe this guy? Can you believe this guy? So for, for how long he has been desperately seeking a miracle? And when he's about to receive it, he questions the way in which it's provided. All because, all because Elisha had given him this advice in a way that he didn't understand. In a way that he felt he was too good for. This is me. This is Naaman. I'm used to the parades. I'm used to all these accolades. Elisha doesn't even come to the door. And then he sends me to some dirty river. You got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. He's, he's furious. As if he knows the way in which a miracle is supposed to be given, right? See, for the longest time, he had stepped out of his own understanding. He's on the right path. His, it's, his path is being straightened out before him. Things are going his way. And then we see him, all because of something he doesn't understand, then we see him wanting to get back off the path again. Simply because he didn't understand the way the advice was given to him. Wow. Point two in your notes. Point two in your notes, church. All of the advice in the world is for nothing if you're not willing to put it to action. You got to put it to action. And we see Naaman's right here, like, oh, I don't know if I want to. I mean, here's a big question for all of us. Truly, who here doesn't want God directing our choices? I mean, who doesn't? Right? He's the designer of all. He's the one who can guide you the best. Right? Maybe you've thought of this question, and you, you, you sincerely, you don't know. You don't know. Maybe you haven't made up your mind yet. Right? Is it really God? I mean, well, let's, let's examine other verses in the Bible. One in particular, let us learn something else that Jesus was trying to tell us. Mainly, mainly, just as I said, that taking action is the key to what God is telling us. See, the Bible goes on to teach us exactly this point, and he teaches us uh, this in Luke. In your notes, you can read along, Luke chapter 6, verse 49. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately 
it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. See, we as adult human beings, and, and, and take it from a person who's been to many college courses and everything, right? You, you, we get in the habit of listening, or at least making it look like we're listening, right? Right? But we don't apply then what was just told to us. We don't apply it. See, we simply move on, and then we go and do what we had planned to do originally. We forget what we were just told. We just go on, and it's, it's human nature. That's what we do. It may be things that you were told in a sermon. It may have been things that you personally read out of the Bible. Hey, it may have even been times when you were getting great advice from someone that you really trusted. Did you listen? Or did you make it look like you were listening? Did you contemplate that advice? Did you contemplate those suggestions? Did you then talk yourself out of doing what, they were at, what you were told? Did you move on and do what you originally wanted to do anyway? Right? Right? This is human nature. We all have done it. All of us. Let me illustrate. Teacher, you guys know I'm a teacher. I, I cannot tell you how many times I have been setting up an office, a classroom, some sort of learning area for the kids, right? And I'm setting it up with the furniture that you get from out of the box, right? That, that furniture out of the box, you get it from Office Depot, Staples, Home Depot, wherever you're getting it from. You pull that furniture out of the box, and in, invariably, what I'm setting up, bookshelves or whatever, it's got an identical left side to the right side, or maybe an identical bottom to the top, right? And on that first time that I give that go around, on the first side, I take the instructions and I follow them closely. I go by point by point by point. And I get to that end result, and I'm happy. It is exactly the way it looks in the picture. It's exactly the way the directions tell me. I'm satisfied. But then, it comes to the next side. Right? Dr. Joe, smart guy here. I got this. I got this. Right? Instead of listening to the designers of the furniture, what do I figure? Yeah, you're shaking your head. You got this, right? I can go it alone. I just had success with this. I just learned. I don't need, I don't need the instructions. Look, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to... You start going ahead. You're building, I'm building. It's looking good. And then all of a sudden, you get to that piece and you're like, oh, no. Oh, no. I just messed it up. I must have forgot something. I must have forgot something, right? And invariably, when you have to start disassembling everything, right, you're scratching the wood finish, you're stripping the screws, that structure is getting weaker and weaker. It happens to me every time. It happens to me every time. The end result of that second side is not what I anticipated. The directions, the step-by-step, -step, the designers gave it to me. I chose not to follow it. I chose not to follow it. See, this is the exact point that's being illustrated in the story with Naaman. See, Naaman was at the point where he had conjured up in his mind the exact way in which all of this healing and everything was going to go down. Naaman expects the prophet to wave his hand over him and cure him. He is expecting this man to put him through some great cleansing ceremony. That's why he's knocking on Elisha's door in the first place. That's why he had gathered all of those treasures from his homeland. That's why he had been to the most powerful king in the world and took this great adventure with his men and horses and chariots all the way to another land to receive this miracle, and I can just picture it the whole time he is conjuring up in his mind, this is the way I expect it to go down. Church, this is a fabulous 
It is a fabulous reflection of what we choose to do in our own lives. We do this. Why? It's the same thing. It's the same thing we do with advice today. See, acknowledge him in all of your ways. Ways equals the action. The action you're supposed to take. You got to take action. Not, not sometimes. Not some of the action. Not when it just feels comfortable to take the action. Right? Not in the ways where you're certain, like me, building the second side, where you're certain you can go it alone. No, 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 no. All of the time. In all of your ways. Church, as a math and science guy, I look at that, that verse from Proverbs. It's a formula. It's simple. It's a simple formula. It's within your grasp. It's, in, it's within my grasp. Lean not on your own understanding. Seek God by acknowledging Him in all of your ways, and He will make your paths straight. I mean, look at the times when we all take that great advice. We all know those times when we, when we took the great advice, we did what we were told, and were able to live in peace and joy afterwards. We didn't have to feel that sting of regret. It wasn't there. We got to, it, it didn't steal our joy. It might have been that right computer purchase, the right cell phone purchase. It may have been that right car purchase or that right home purchase. You're able to live in peace. Let us examine the very last part of Naaman's story as he ponders the advice that's been given to him. And if it's worth putting into action, if it's worth this great man's consideration, is this advice going into this dirty river? I don't know. Is it? Right? I wish you could see the kids when I show them this story. It's so cute in their, in their innocence. They're sitting there on the edge of their seats, and they're, they're just looking at Naaman as he's talking to his men at the side of the Jordan River, looking at them like they're crazy. And the kids are all sitting there like, come on, just go do it, just, come on, Naaman, just go in, just go do what he says. And he drops his armor down and sword, and he looks frustrated. And they're like, yeah, he's going to do it, he's going to get in, he's going to get in the river. Let's, turn, let's look at that verse, the last part of his story, 2 Kings 14 through 15. So he went down and he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And so he returned to the man of God. He comes back to Elisha. He and all of his aides... And he came and he stood before him and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Another revelation moment right there. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. See, Naaman's victory. He comes up out of that Jordan River the seventh time, and his skin is pure, restored, just like the pure skin of a baby. All of the stress, all of the worry that he had been going through for all that time, gone. It's gone. He's restored. Naaman meets his destiny. Why? Well, because it's simple. He put the whole formula together. And that's the very point that God is making. Point three. When you back God's advice with action, that is exactly when you will experience God in all of his glory. It's that time. Right? What great difficulty are you facing now? Have you started this process? Are you seeking? Are you starting the prayers? Are you inviting God in? Are you listening? 
Are you at the point where you're going to be applying that advice now? See, because if you can do all of these things, then you can begin the best part of all. Experiencing God in all of His glory. See, right now, if you are realizing that you are a hearer of the Word of God, but you're not a doer, I'm going to give you the best advice that I have ever heard from God. Take it from a person who has been to uh, university for years and years and years. The best advice never came out of that university. This is the best advice. Are there actions that you need to take today? Because if you really want to see God making a difference in your situations, in your decisions, it'll all change today by taking that formula, putting it to action. Acknowledge God with all of your problems. When you do that, you allow Him to do things that you could not have possibly imagined, just like Naaman. There was no way that he could have imagined that was going to happen. Jesus tells us again in Ephesians about his ability to do things for you that you could not have possibly imagined. It comes to us in Ephesians 3, chapter 20. Now, to him who is able to do, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to that power that works within us. See, He will do things for you that you could not have imagined. Not you could not have imagined. That's what the verse tells us. I can remember, I can remember a time in my own career when I was being slandered pretty badly. It was due to my handling of a very aggressive child in my classroom. And many teachers who had had this kid before had never experienced any of these behaviors, right? But there were students at risk, and I had to take some very drastic measures. And it really didn't matter to those teachers what the story was and why I was doing what I was doing. All they could see is that I was ostracizing this child. I was putting him off in a corner. I was separating him from the kids. They didn't ask why. They didn't care why. They just continued to slander me, slander my own reputation. I knew the kid's family was talking to them, and for months and months and months, I'm going to school, stomach in knots. I'm nervous. I can't stand this in my own mind. I mean, my reputation took a beating. I'm being questioned. Hey, you can do this, and you're just being unfair. You're overreacting. I did, you know. So it was at that time that I took uh, this problem to a pastor friend of mine again and again and again. And I remember him praying over me again and again and again. And one time he looked up at me and he just said, Look, God is telling me to tell you, Joe. Take that problem, that thing that that you're never going to be able to overcome this. Hand it to God. Just give it to Him. Let Him go and fight those battles. Let Him work this out for you. He will resolve it. I couldn't imagine how it was going to get done. I Honestly, I thought I was done. I did not know. And listen... I took those words. I remember taking those words and I putting them to action because I had to continue to go to school and keep my mouth shut. Not defend myself. Not lash out. Not go and try to defend my honor. Because if I would have done that, it would make me look even more guilty. So I, I, I kept my nose to the grindstone. I just kept working and doing what I knew was right. And I kept moving and moving and moving. And one weekend, I'm reading in the newspaper that this child had been arrested for the exact behaviors that I had been highlighting all of these months. About a week later, that family called me. They asked me, Dr. Joe, we need you. We need you in court. 
You got to come help us. I felt such, I was so vindicated. That was it. That's what I had been saying all that time. I took the advice, I put it to action, and it was finally working out. Something I could never have imagined. My reputation is restored. Things started going right. My path was straightened. I got to experience God in all of his glory. Naaman got to experience God in all of his glory. Look, putting God's words to action allows you to begin the greatest part of this formula that you could possibly imagine. Just as I did, just as Naaman did, I'm going to urge you today, take that formula from Proverbs. Take it with you out that door, out the church. Take it with you wherever you go. I urge you, use that formula in all all of your ways. All of them. Church, let's bow our heads. God, thank you for our chance to worship and to revel in your glory during this Christmas season. We are so grateful to you, God, that we have the opportunity, the life, the life we need to live by your great words, your great guidance, your great mercy. Lord, as we leave your house today, may you put the strength in all of us to carry forward the great advice, the great guidance that you are continually pouring onto us. And Lord, as we head into this new year, may we look to you even more. May we reach out to you even further to acknowledge you in all of your ways. And God's church said, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.